You are listening to The Overwhelmed Brain. If anxiety is sneaking up on you at the least convenient moment, visit quietbegins.com and check out the safe empowerment system for social anxiety. You shouldn't have to suffer when there is a path to freedom and ease. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Paul Coliani and I'm here to help you increase your emotional intelligence so that you can avoid dysfunction, handle toxic situations with grace and ease, and show up as your authentic self. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that could affect your physical or mental health. All right, we have a topic today on being single. Is the idea of being single scary to you? Is it something you're going through now? Is it something that you want to go through? I uh, I am what my girlfriend calls a serial monogamist. And uh, that means that pretty much, I mean, this is her definition. That means pretty much that I get into a relationship and I stay in one until that relationship ends and I get into another one. (laughs) And that's it. And I just keep getting into what I hope to be the final relationship of my life. And here I am again, 48 years old, in the final relationship of my life. (laughs) We want this. I think a lot of us, I should say, want this. We want the relationship that lasts, that keeps us going, that uh, makes us wake up in the morning happy that we're with this person, whether we live with them or we're just with them somewhere else. Uh, we're dating them. We want to be happy with someone else. We're social creatures. We want to relate to each other. And especially we want to be intimate with each other. I'm making some generalizations. Not everyone necessarily wants this. But we're sort of born wanting some sort of romantic relationship. And then throughout life, that might change. We might get into a romantic relationship And it was the worst experience ever, so we want to stay out of them. Or some of us might get into relationships and we stick around in a relationship that doesn't work. Or we stick around in a relationship that is working tremendously well. Or we never get into a relationship at all. I've talked to people like this. I've talked to people in their 20s, 30s. Um, I know someone, in fact, I probably shouldn't make any details here, but there's someone I know personally that... um, is dating someone that hasn't, I don't know, ever dated someone, ever been in a relationship with someone. And he has gotten to the point where he is happy to find anyone, anyone to date. And he did. And he's happy. And the woman I know, she's happy too. They're both happy. And he had gone many, many, many years. And she had been married twice And they're happy together. Imagine me and you. (laughs) The idea of finding someone that you can be happy with, it's appealing to the majority of people listening right now. It is appealing. Now, I, I know that I can't cover every single person's thought process, but some people don't want to be in relationships for whatever reason. I know several women that said, you know what? I'm sick of men. (laughs) I would rather have no relationship than a relationship with a man. Or they seek another woman's companionship. And maybe men drove them that way. Maybe there was a proclivity in them to uh, try that out. Maybe that's how they always were. They wanted to seek the companionship of someone of the same sex. doesn't matter. They look for that companionship and they learn what works and what doesn't. I think that's a good point. You look for companionship in someone out there and you figure out what works. Now, there are going to be people 
that uh, are certainly against the type of intimacy and bonding that is against certain religious values or just values in general. There are going to be people against that. Not on this show. (laughs) This show is wide open. This show acknowledges and accepts all kinds of people because companionship is I enjoy being with you and you enjoy being with me and we have a good time together or us as a couple enjoy you as a couple or you know it can really stretch out there into the many numbers of people involved. I try not to go into that type of subject too much because there are other shows dedicated to that and uh, a couple is challenging enough. (laughs) A couple of people in a relationship can be challenging enough because each person has their own issues. Each person has their own baggage, if you want to call it that, has their own set of beliefs, their own values, their own perceptions about the world. And you get two people together and you try to integrate those two sets of beliefs, values, and perceptions. And what do you have? You have a new person or a thing or a relationship corporation (laughs) where you have two people that are running this relationship business and hopefully going in the same direction. When you bring all these values and perceptions and beliefs into a relationship, you build a new unifying force that you can go forward together and build something even greater than yourselves. I like to look at a relationship as something even greater than ourselves. Something that we can look to the future and envision something bigger, something wonderful, something more appealing than just being by myself, just being alone, just being single. But single has its advantages. Single allows you not to integrate because sometimes the integration of those thoughts and feelings and beliefs and perceptions, sometimes that doesn't work out. Sometimes you meet someone that doesn't have the best intentions for you. Sometimes you meet someone that maybe they do have good intentions, but they have completely different values and beliefs and perceptions. And you are now stuck with this relationship corporation, this building that you created that is supposed to be your relationship, your foundation of something new, something bigger than you. But it's a zigzaggy course. You want to go in that direction and they want to go in the other direction and you want to go in this direction and you are struggling the whole way through or at least often. There are times when you struggle and then the relationship goes along this zigzaggy course and you don't know what to do. And sometimes you can talk about it and get through it. Sometimes there's just a meeting of the minds and everything works out or at least you make some small compromises or even sacrifices for the greater good of the bigger vision of this relationship corporation, or somebody doesn't want to compromise. Somebody doesn't want to sacrifice. And both paths are valid. Both paths are healthy in the sense that if you do sacrifice for the greater good, for the greater vision of what you can have together, and you can both agree that this is going to be the best for both of you, then you can create something wonderful, something that makes you both happier. It doesn't always work out. I don't endorse sacrifice on this show. I don't tell you that you should sacrifice for your partner. I am more along the lines of you should support your partner's path. You should support your partner's happiness. And then when you do that, then you both want to hold hands and walk into the sunset together because you both are doing that for each other and you love that about each other. And it feels so supportive and loving and caring and nurturing that uh, you wouldn't want to be with anyone else ever. But, you know, sometimes we do have things that come up that, hey, if you don't stop doing this, then this relationship can't move forward. This does happen. And when it happens, there has to be some serious talk about it. There has to be a serious discussion on the importance of the relationship overall over this thing that someone might have to compromise on or sacrifice. It doesn't mean that the individual person should sacrifice or has to, but at least there's a conversation about it. And can the conversation be healthy enough and non-toxic enough to get to a space of, well, if you don't want to sacrifice or compromise this thing 
that I can't agree with, maybe it's best we go our separate ways. Hopefully you can have a healthy enough conversation like that where that can be an option. I'm not saying it should be an option. You know, this is tough. Well, let's just go our separate ways. There's no problem doing that. Everyone will be happy. That is hard. I get it. But hopefully you can have that type of conversation and even come to that conclusion, not that separating would be the automatic next thing. It's just a matter of coming to that conclusion. There's a a time when my girlfriend and I met that I lived in New Hampshire and she lived in Georgia. And I came to the conclusion that I was not going to move to Georgia. And she couldn't move to New Hampshire because she had her son and shared custody with her ex-husband. And moving to New Hampshire without her son means she wouldn't get to see her son. Moving to New Hampshire with her son would mean violation of a shared custody order or something. And uh, so she felt very stuck. And she wanted a relationship with me. But I thought about it very carefully and I decided I wanted to live in New Hampshire. I came to that conclusion. And I told her this. I said, you know, I've thought about this and I really would like a relationship with you, but I'm not going to leave New Hampshire. I really love it here. And I heard her on the phone and she's like, what? She didn't understand. She, She didn't know what to do with this information because we were growing closer and we were getting along really well. And she said, okay, I, I, I get it. And we finished our conversation uh, and we hung up and overnight I got to think about what we talked about. She got to think about what we talked about. And um, I'm speaking in hindsight now, but she came to the, what I believe the, the healthy perspective that she was going to honor my path. And she came to an acceptance that that is how this relationship is going to be. In in other words, it's really not going to be a relationship at all because we didn't want to have a long distance one. So she decided that, okay, this isn't going to be a relationship. I've come to that acceptance, even though she wanted it. However, my overnight thinking was coming to a place inside of me feeling very good that I stood up for what I wanted for myself, feeling very good for the first time that I wasn't going to be a serial monogamist, feeling very good that I wasn't just going to follow the next person that liked me anywhere they went, anywhere they lived. I wasn't going to just give up wherever I was and move to them because that's what I did all my life. I would move to where they were. I would go wherever they wanted. It's the old people pleaser in me just following somebody along. And it usually worked out. It was okay. I had some losses along the way. Some friendships went bankrupt and all this other stuff. <laughs> some big losses. But uh, it, it still worked out. I'm okay now. Uh, it, but I looked at my past and realized I follow the person I want to be with everywhere. What do I want for me? What if nobody was in my life? What would I do? And I answered that question. If no one was in my life, this is what I would do. I would stay in New Hampshire. I love it here and I'll I'll be happy to be near my family. And I had all these wonderful, positive thoughts about being where I was. And so that's why I told her, I, I really want to stay here. And so her overnight thinking came to an acceptance of that. My overnight thinking, however, where I was starting to get to, uh, I became very proud of myself. Like I said, I was for the first time doing something for me. Not following my heart like we're always told to do. I was just doing something that I wanted to do for me. Knowing that it could cause a disconnect, cause a detachment or take away the bonding that had grown over the past few months that we'd been talking on the phone and such. Knowing that that could happen and deciding for myself where I wanted to stay, uh, I got really proud of myself and I felt really good in myself. And it's almost as if I had achieved something, a success of some sort, because I finally did it. I finally decided to make a decision based on what I wanted and nobody else. And after I had that realization, the new realization came to me that I have now achieved something that I'd never done before. And now I can make any decision I want. 
And that was a strange thing because what had happened was I came to the conclusion that this is what I wanted to do for myself. And I, it's almost like a self test. I passed that test. This is what I wanted to do for me. I was going to stay. I was absolutely serious about it. And the overnight thinking that I had and the next day I thought, well, now I feel like I'm not limited in what I can decide. Now I feel like I'm free to decide anything I want and be with anybody I want. And that freedom allowed clarity to sink in or allowed my head to defog and give me what I needed to make the next right choice for me, which was move to Georgia. (laughs) It's a strange thing that happens, but coming to a conclusion of what you want clears the fog. And then actually deciding that's what you're going to do and telling others that's what you're going to do really starts to solidify your path and give you some momentum to move forward. It takes you out of the old patterns that you might have been in because you didn't want to hurt someone's feelings or because thinking that if you serve yourself, it's selfish. I was serving myself. I wanted to know what it was like to do what I wanted. And when we talked the next day, I I called her up and she's like, okay, you know, I thought about it and I really appreciated that you actually wanted to do something for you. I mean, I didn't expect her to say this. She, she started talking before I did. She said, I really appreciated that you want to do something for, for you. I really respect that. And I thought to myself, wow, this is not only did I give her like the bad news that we're not going to be together because I want to stay here, but she called me up and says, I respect that you made that decision after following your heart all this time and following the women around in your life, wherever they go, there you are. You decided to do something for you. That is probably the best answer you could have given me. Because if you had said, I'm going to come down there and be with you, I would have felt just like every other woman that you followed. And you really don't have a mind of your own. You just want to be with the next person. And I heard this out of her voice and I'm thinking, those were my thoughts. (laughs) I mean, some of those thoughts were mine. Yet she came up with this on her own. And she felt good that I made this conclusion. She felt good that I came to this place into myself. And so after she shared that, I was really shocked. I was like, wow, I mean, you, you're right. And I'm, I'm shocked that you feel this way. I thought you would be upset or sad. And she said, well, yeah, I am sad. I mean, I think we could have something, but I'm good as well. Because I don't want to start a relationship based on this old, maybe dysfunctional pattern. I mean, I'm kind of putting words in her mouth here, but this is what I got from it. This old dysfunctional pattern that you were following that you needed someone in your life all the time. And I was just going to be the next best thing that came along. So here you are again, just following your heart. When I heard her say all this, I became even more proud of myself and proud of my decision because following my path really gave me, like I said, clarity really made me feel good about myself. And here was someone reinforcing that I made the right decision. And again, this is not the action I took. This was the conclusion I came to. This was the decision I made. And overnight and the next day while we're talking, she says this to me and guess what I come out with? I've thought about it. (laughs) And I realized that I can come back to New Hampshire anytime I want. I can move down there and spend some time with you. And if I don't like it, I can come back. And she's like, what? (laughs) I said, I just realized, you know, after I came out of me, after I finally gave myself permission to follow my own path, it cleared it up. It wasn't, it wasn't stopping me anymore. It wasn't controlling me anymore. It, it allowed me to be free to make any choice that I wanted. And she is now flabbergasted. (laughs) She said, what do you mean? Are you, are, do you want to move down here? I said, well, here's what I want to do. And I said, I want to move down there for a month and see if it, everything's cool with us. See if you like me and I like you. I mean, continually being around each other all the time and even living together. You know, if that's cool with you, then maybe we can just try it out and see what happens. And she's like, wow, wow, uh, what? <laughs> we talked about it some more and I told her what I thought about overnight and how I no longer feel like I have to follow an old pattern or old behavior to fill some sort of 
dysfunctional void in me or I need someone to complete, complete me or make me happy. I just want to do this. Next thing, this other thing, instead of staying in New Hampshire, I want to do this other thing for me. Felt really good to say, I want to do this for me. And she wanted me to do it for me as well. And that kind of support system when you're in a relationship is what strengthens the relationship. When you can look at that person and say, I'm going to support you, even though what you're saying will make me sad, will upset me, will make me feel bad that you're doing it. I'm not saying this works for every situation or every decision. If your partner says, I'm going to turn the entire house into a roller skating rink, it may not be something that you want, but they're determined and you might think, well, I don't know what's happening with you, but I need to take a break from this. Uh, So, you know, supporting that path for them might not work in your benefit, not might not work in your favor because it may not be something that you want. I could totally do it my house. (laughs) I would love to turn my house into a roller skating rink, but that's another story for another day. Uh, (laughs) But the idea of somebody doing something that you supporting is something they're, they're, they they want to do for themselves that doesn't necessarily impact you directly. I mean, yes, me staying in New Hampshire, not moving down, impacted her, but that's bound to happen. You're going to make decisions that aren't going to be all wonderful for everyone. They're going to be wonderful for you, but other people aren't going to be happy about them. But then they have to deal with that. They have to work through that. They have to figure that out. And then they have to figure out if their love is more selfless or at least somewhat selfless and not so much selfish because it's good to be selfish and want love and want intimacy and want support from someone else but it's also good to be selfless to show the person that you really really want them to be happy and if that's the path that makes them happy that's the path that you're going to support And let me just finalize this segment by saying just because you support it doesn't mean it's going to happen. Sometimes what happens is you support something they come to a conclusion on and they decide not to go through with it just because they finally feel validated. They finally feel like, wow, I just did something for me and and the person I love in my life supported that even though they didn't like it. That makes me feel so special inside that it's not even important for me to do this thing anymore. I just had to get to that space of validation, that space that I am important, that I am worthy enough to make these decisions, to follow through with these decisions, and that somebody else sees that in me, recognizes that worth in me to make me feel so important. I couldn't ask for anything more than that type of support. And because of that, It makes me want to be with this person more, be more bonded, be closer, and even change my plans, not because I'm going to sacrifice anything, but because I feel even happier being with this other person because they want me to be happy. And I know this is true because I came to a conclusion. I decided to do something and I was going to do it. And they said, by all means, go for it because I love you. When they said that, suddenly this other pursuit wasn't as important. Suddenly that that could go in the back burner for now because, wow, look at this other person in front of me. I want to devote more time and energy to them. This does happen. I'm not saying it happens every time. It does happen. And I'm not saying that you should always agree just to get that outcome because that may not happen. You should come to the conclusion in yourself that I want to support this person because I really love them and I really want them to be happy. And when you can do that for each other, that's what strengthens and builds the greatest relationship that you can get. When we come back, I'm going to talk about the uh, beginning of what I started to talk about, about being single. I'm going to read you an email and um, we'll discuss it and see where it goes about uh, someone who's been sort of a serial monogamist like me. And she's asking, you know, what is my next best step? Should I stay single? Should I do this? Should I do that? Looking forward to this one. Be right back.
I remember the day I had to make a phone call to the owner of my mom's business. One of their delivery drivers crashed, and I had information about the crash that would help the person who drove. In fact, um, my mom wanted the delivery person to get his side told, and I guess I was a witness to it. I don't remember what exactly I knew, but I knew I had to make the call. I was 10 (laughs) or 11. It was very, very young age. And I remember getting on the phone and being frozen with fear. Not being able to speak with articulation or clarity, I barely could get the words out. I remember the day like it was just a few days ago. (laughs) Not yesterday, but just a few days ago. uh, Because it was so nerve-wracking. And uh, I had to say certain things in a certain way. And my mom or someone was standing over my shoulder. And I had to pick up the phone and leave this message on this machine. And I just remember sounding, I don't know, I, I remember all these pauses and trying to remember the next thing to say and my heart was racing I think I was sweating I know I was experiencing anxiety in fact it might be my first experience with anxiety and uh, from that point on you know talk about presentation anxiety I did not like talking on the phone I mean I did I went when I grew up I ended up talking on the phone quite a bit on some jobs and look where I am now I'm talking all the time but Back then, it was the beginning of a lifetime of, I don't know if I'd call it fear, but there was an emotional resistance to getting on the phone. And even today, I'm not the kind of guy that just picks up the phone and calls people. I would much rather chat. I would much rather email. I love talking to people. I love talking to people one-on-one. I've even been known to give a speech or two. But to pick up the phone, it's that old pattern that comes up. I don't know if that was the origination of my fears, but I know that was probably one of the first incidents that I had to go through that uh, really set the tone and stage for my life from that point on. The reason I'm telling you this is because we don't know sometimes where these things come from. I can probably look at that incident and go, okay, that's where it came from. But how do I get over it? How do I get past it? What if I can't move past it? And what else in my life has it affected because of that? I mean, being able to pick up the phone to call someone, that should be easy. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes the old pattern comes in and I just want to send an email instead. Is it because there's a little bit of anxiety in me? Uh, Maybe. Maybe there is. But this is why I created the safe system for social anxiety. It's not just for social anxiety. It's for any kind of anxiety that comes up. We focus on the social aspect of it because that's where it affects us most when we're around others. But yeah, we can carry around anxiety for little things like that and turn them into big things. Uh, But I needed to start really concentrating on my health and my healing and my well-being and being able to get over these silly little things, what I think are silly, so I can lead a normal life, so I can get through what doesn't affect a lot of people but affects me. And for those of you that I talk on the phone with, my coaching clients and other people, those aren't the times I'm talking about. I'm talking about general stuff like calling up the cable company or calling someone about an ad for a barbecue grill something simple things that should be easier it's just funny how this little stuff kind of hangs around when we don't need it so anyway the safe system over at quietbegins.com helps you start the healing process and the mental what i might consider repatterning of old emotional triggers that turn into anxiety so that you can start living the life that you want instead of living a life that feels controlled and you're made to feel like you can't do anything that you really want to do or maybe don't really want to do it but you don't really want to experience anxiety doing it. So I want to introduce you to these techniques and processes and exercises. It's a mixture of conscious and subconscious processes that help you rewire what's going on in there so you can start to get new perceptions, new beliefs, new thoughts and especially have the tools you need to get through those anxiety moments. If you're interested in a system like this, go to quietbegins.com and check out the safe empowerment system for social anxiety. Now, oh, if you're wondering if that uh, delivery driver actually got in trouble for it, I think he still did. (laughs) I don't think I was much help, and maybe that was more of a reinforcement that uh, it wasn't such a positive experience for me. Quietbegins.com.
All right, welcome back. Like I said, I'm going to read you an email. I'm just going to get right into it and let's see uh, where we go with it. Hi, Paul. I recently discovered your podcast and it really helped me. In the past three years, I've gone through three relationships with three different guys. All of the breakups were eerily similar in that all the men broke up with me and I was completely blindsided. Through listening to your show, I realized I didn't really grow in between each relationship. Growing up, my parents would often scream at each other a few times a week, sometimes over minuscule things, and this has made me terrified of conflict of any kind. I often swallow any annoyances or frustrations that I have with my partners and find it incredibly difficult to verbalize how I'm feeling. Through therapy, I also realized I was not allowed to express my emotions when I was younger if they made my family upset and that my emotions were often dismissed. I have also realized I have jumped from relationship to relationship out of loneliness. This time, I'm determined to take a break and work on me, at least for a few months. Any advice you have for how to grow, be able to verbalize my feelings, be okay with being single for a while, and or dealing with conflict better would be appreciated. Thanks so much. All right, I'm going to call you Janet. Janet, thank you so much for uh, sharing that, and I can relate. You know, I've been in relationship after relationship where they left me and it was always a shock. You know, you can look back and see the signs. I could look back and see all the red flags like, oh, the relationship's going to end. Uh, and that's because I know what I know now. And hopefully you can look back and see those signs too. So that when you do get into your next relationship, you know that something is happening here and that something needs to be done about it. And this is one of those first compelling motivational pointers that I want you to remember is that when you start to see the similar signs as you did before, then it should compel you to do something a bit riskier, a bit different. And what I mean by that is, let's just say that uh, at the end of one of your relationships, you started having less and less sex, or you started not being able to communicate the way you used to communicate. Uh, maybe there were more quiet times and they weren't comfortable quiet times. Maybe you were arguing more. You can look at these little things and when you're in it, you think, well, this is normal. This is what happens in a relationship. I mean, you might have thought that. Uh, that's what I thought. Uh, and this is just one of those phases. But you look at each relationship that has ended and you look at the patterns. What has been the pattern? In fact, you might want to write those down. What were the signs of my last three relationships so that I know what to look for? Not that every time you have those signs, it's going to end, but you look for the patterns and you realize, oh, this is the same thing that happened before. Why? Why did this happen before? And you're already giving me good reasons why it could have happened before. Not that it was your fault, but you certainly are part of the formula for the breakdown of the relationship. And one part of that formula is I'm afraid of confrontation. This is one of the most important steps to take in your relationship is to not avoid confrontation. If you avoid confrontation, what you do is build this negative enigmatic energy in the relationship that you just can't figure out what's going on or why it's getting worse. And what I mean by that is I spent so much time in every one of my relationships not sharing my true feelings, not sharing that I was upset about something my partner did, not sharing so many things that I wanted to share because I wanted to keep the peace. I wanted to stay out of confrontation just like you. And every time I can look at it, you know, this is one of the benefits of getting older is that you can look at more relationships that you've had and more years that you've had on this planet and realize oh, those were mistakes. <laughs> those were errors in judgment and thinking. The errors in judgment and thinking were keeping things that I thought would upset my partner and other people that I loved, uh, keeping from them information that was important to me. If they said something or did something that made me angry, I would keep my anger to myself, you know, repress it, swallow it and let it come out in other passive aggressive destructive ways later and when I did that even when I was good at hiding it it still seeped out and into the relationship slowly poisoning it 
and slowly repelling them because they never could figure out where I was. And this is one of the dangers of keeping your emotions to yourself. A, they don't know where you are, so they have to make it up. Like I said, you can hide it all you want, but it doesn't work because they can feel it. They can tell something's wrong. It's your body language. It's the amount of silence compared to the amount of talking you used to do before. It's avoiding certain subjects. It's that certain look. It's your passive aggressiveness. It's a whole slew of things that you do and how you show up that they eventually can't figure out, that they can't understand where you are, what's going on, even when you say, no, everything is fine. I love you. Everything is wonderful. I'm so happy with this relationship. It'll still bug, I'm going to say it, it's still going to bug the crap out of them. They can't figure it out. And it's not going to be very conscious either. My partners in life, they could not consciously figure out why their love for me was dissolving. It's because I hid myself from them. I did not want them to know the real me. Because if they knew that I was angry at them, for example... They might yell at me, they might leave me, they might do something to keep me alone. My main motivation for not wanting to confront was to avoid being alone. Do you realize if you walk around with your main motivation being that you don't want to be alone, that you are actually making decisions based on fear and bringing about what you don't want to happen? Think about this. What motivates you? When you're doing something based on something you love and you're using what's called a moving toward strategy, when you're moving towards something that you appreciate, that you want, that you really want to work in your life, when you're moving towards something like that instead of running away from fear, the away from strategy, moving toward usually has positive feelings associated with it, usually leads to more fulfillment It is movement in the right direction, so to speak, in the direction that you will feel most fulfilled, most satisfied in your life. That's typically why they said you should always move towards something you want instead of away from something you don't want. Not the only reason, but that's a a compelling reason. And that's why it's important to understand what is driving your behavior. If what is driving your behavior is that you're afraid to be alone, it's not going to work. Um, you know, I can't say that 100% for sure every time, but look how it's worked so far. If that's what's been driving you, mainly, you know, there is the toward like, I love this person. I want to be with this person. I'm very happy. But what's behind that? And you can always find out what's behind that. What's the main motivation for you to move in that direction by asking yourself, well, if I tell them how I really feel, what would happen? They might get upset with me. They might leave me. They may not, may not want this relationship. And if I don't have this relationship and I'm alone, I'm deathly afraid of that. Because being alone means that I'm not worthy and I'm not important. If you fall into that self-deprecating trap, that negative self-perception that you're not important, you're not worthy, you're not significant. And if you have those underlying and you suddenly feel that that's how it will be when you're alone, then I can almost guarantee you that's what's driving your behavior. And when that drives your behavior, instead of something more positive, like I just want to be with this person. And if I express my feelings and they leave me, well, that's too bad. They're missing out on something great here because I should be able to express my, my true thoughts and emotions to this person without worrying all the time that they're going to leave me. There's a difference in how you think and how you approach conversations in your decision-making and especially in how you express yourself, there's a huge difference between saying, I don't want to express myself because they might leave me, and I should be able to express myself because someone who loves me is going to support me even when I make them upset. Because if my relationship is hanging by a thread that any upset that I show is going to make them leave, then maybe this is the wrong relationship for me. This is the kind of thinking that you need to be really clear about where it comes from What's motivating you? What is motivating you to not express yourself? What is motivating you to lie instead of tell the truth? What is motivating you to do a number of things? Is it because, well, I'm afraid they'll do something. I'm afraid they'll get mad. I'm afraid they'll leave. 
even though that might be there? Is that your main motivation? And like I said, you can figure out if it's your main motivation by just the language you use, in your own head even. There's a huge difference between saying, of course I'm going to tell him or her the truth. And if they leave because of that, because I want to express myself, because I want to share my most authentic emotions, then this relationship was always hanging by a thread, and I shouldn't walk around on eggshells being afraid to express myself. That kind of language is so much more positive and so much more towards something you want. And your decisions aren't being controlled by this sense of fear that you carry around. I'm not saying it's easy to change. In fact, it's very difficult if you carry around low self-worth, low self-esteem, a low self-perception. That's what needs to change. And in your email, Janet, you say that you're going to take a few months off. I think that's phenomenal. That's exactly what I had to do when my marriage ended. And um, it was the day after my divorce. I thought, okay, now I can get into another relationship. Um, It took me like a month of being on online dating sites and thinking, all right, I'm just going to find this other relationship so I can be happy again. And I heard myself say this. And I thought, what? (laughs) What am I thinking? Am I so reliant on someone else to make me complete, to make me happy, that I need to jump into the next relationship? What does that say about me? Am I not already happy? Or is there some empty space in me or a void that I'm avoiding that I think can only be filled by someone else? Is that what's really compelling me? Because that means that someone else is always expected and under pressure to fulfill something in me that I can't fulfill in myself. That's why we're told we got to love ourselves and be compassionate toward ourselves. I say this on my show all the time. You show yourself that you are worthy, you are important, and damn, you're a good catch. (laughs) I mean, really, you put yourself in that little bit higher ego bracket and say, I'm a good catch. And if they can't handle the truth, then what the heck? How fragile is this relationship? You don't want fragile relationships. You want relationships that can withstand the hurricane of your negative emotions. I'm not saying you <laughs> turn it into a hurricane, uh, but it feels that way. It feels like the this, this relationship's going to be destroyed if I share something that is important to me and my truth and might upset them. We think it's going to destroy the relationship. I mean, some of us have, that have gone through this, or maybe you, Janet, thinking that if you share this, that it's going to be tumultuous and it's going to be the thing that destroys it When in reality, a relationship should be resilient enough to withstand the truth. A relationship should be resilient enough for you to be your authentic self. Because a relationship is built on supporting each other and nurturing each other and being kind to each other and respectful for each other. And when you really love each other, to be able to express an upset to the other person shows that other person that you respect them and you trust them to be able to talk about this with you. I mean, how honoring is it when someone says, look, I need to tell you something. I'm afraid you're going to be upset, but I have to tell you because I want to be honest with you. I mean, no matter what it is, it could be the worst news you never want to hear in the world, but to be with someone who honors you to the point where they're willing to take a risk and lose the relationship to tell you the truth, that's the kind of person I want in my life. And that's the kind of person I am showing up as in my life as well. I mean, that's my story. And that's what I'm telling you is that when you show up for someone like this and honor them by expressing your true self, by being authentic, they're going to want nothing more than to be with you more. Unless it's against their values, unless it's one of those deal breakers in a relationship, unless the truth of what you're telling is something betraying and they can't handle it, that could happen. But most of the stuff that we don't tell our partners or loved ones is not that way. It's not the deal breaker. It's just something that maybe we know they're going to be upset about and we don't want to make them upset so we don't tell them. And sometimes it's silly stuff. Well, they might be so upset they they yell at me or leave me. You should not walk on eggshells in your relationship that way. Because if you are, then that kind of relationship is one of those that give you headaches, they give you anxiety. You don't want to go through every day worrying that the person that you're with 
is going to find out something about you. So you try to hide it, you try to repress it. And that puts you in this diminishing, dissolving place that continues to destroy the relationship very subtly. You can't see it happening. It just slowly disintegrates in front of you until they leave. So this is, you know, probably something you already knew, Janet. Maybe you know this stuff because you expressed it in your letter to me. But coming back to what drives you to be in a relationship or keep a relationship or express yourself, all of these driving factors, these deep programs that run inside of you that cause you to go after something you want towards something positive. I mean, think about that. Think about the things that you went for in your life that weren't driven by fear. And how did those work out? Even if you didn't get them, it was still a more positive journey. As opposed to the example of relationships when you are not expressing yourself. I mean, think about it this way. Here's a good example. Let's just say that you have a cousin or your own child, for example, that you really love, a sister or brother that you really love, and you find out that they're getting bullied. Let's just say they're younger. They, they're they getting bullied. And you find out who it is. And then suddenly you're in front of the bully with this person. And they're bullying that child or young adult right in front of you. You're probably like me. You're going to protect the person you love going towards something that is positive because you love them. I am protecting you because I love you. Even though there's a chance that you could be hurt, that you could be bullied yourself. But it doesn't matter because it overrides the fear. And I want you to remember this kind of example, something that can override the fear because it's for a positive outcome. The outcome is you protect the person you love because you love them. This is very similar to having something that you want to say and you're afraid to say it. But if you really love the person, you really want to honor them, you're going to tell them the truth. You're going to be expressive. It's going to be hard. I'm not saying it's easy because the first time you do it, you're afraid of the consequences. But if you're focusing on the consequence of I'm telling you this because I love you, because I want to be honest with you, because I want the relationship to be stronger, because when we survive what I'm going to tell you, it only makes it stronger and it makes them love me more because they realize I'm going to tell them the truth no matter what. It's sort of like, I don't know if you've ever worked with someone that is straight up, honest, isn't afraid to tell you the truth, isn't afraid to criticize your work and also compliment it because that is their truth. I've known people like that and you know you're always going to get a straight answer out of them. Those are the kind of people that most people will go to. Hey, we know uh, Bill or Sarah is going to give us a straight answer, so let's go ask him or her. And you go to them and, and you tell them the project you're working on and let's say Bill says, I don't like it. It's this, this, and this. I don't like it at all. And you know Bill's telling the truth because Bill has also said good things about other projects that you've worked on. So you know you're always going to get a straight answer. When you know someone like that, someone that's always straight up, tells you what's on their mind, there's no mystery. There's no puzzle. You know what to expect from them and you respect them. Typically. I mean, unless they're a jerk. <laughs> but people can be honest without being a jerk. Some people are jerks. If they're critical and they never compliment or when they criticize this in a mean way, that's different. I'm talking about people that just give you their honest answer. I'm, I think I'm one of those people where somebody says, hey, what do you think of this? Uh, I don't like it. Oh, oh, okay. That's good to know. <laughs> but that takes a while to get to that space of being honest, of being direct, and also being diplomatic, tactful. You can get into that space without being mean. That's what the people in your life will do with you. They will start to respect you more. They will be honest with you because you're being honest with them, typically. And your relationships won't have surprise endings. They won't be disintegrating because you're being honest with them, allowing them to be honest with you so that when there is trouble, you bring it up. When you don't bring it up, that's when the relationship disintegrates and that's when you have these surprise endings that you don't like and suddenly you're wondering, what the heck am I doing wrong? Maybe I'm just not right for relationships and like you said, maybe I need to take a break. Yes, you do need to take a break. You need to focus on yourself and say, I am worthy, I am important, I am significant, and I'm a good catch. And I'm going to be that way for someone because I'm going to be honest with them. 
I'm going to be more authentic. I'm going to face my fears and just tell them what's on my mind. So many relationship issues stem from someone not telling the truth. So many relationship issues stem from someone not expressing themselves, not being authentic. And had you been authentic, you can avoid so much lost time with one or both people wondering what the heck is going on in the relationship. Why is this so challenging? Uh, Why is it falling apart when all somebody had to do is speak up and say, well, this is how I really feel. When you do this, I feel that way. What? And they might have an argument. That's okay. Better an argument fast than a slow disintegration into destruction and eventual detachment where love dissolves completely. We don't want that. And so I'm going to answer your last question, Janet, and that is any advice you have for how to grow and be able to verbalize my feelings and be okay with being single for a while and or dealing with conflict better would be appreciated. And I'm going to give you the short answer after the after what I just said, which is if you're okay with being single, I want you to keep that feeling that you're okay being single, even when you're in a relationship. This is what makes you honest. It really does. And believe it or not, when you have this I'm okay being single thought and feeling with you, you usually end up in deeper, more connected relationships overall. Because the fear of being single isn't compelling your decisions, isn't motivating your behavior. You're not driven by fear after that. You're actually driven by a positive comment about yourself. I am okay being single. That's a great comment about yourself. So when you go into a relationship like that and you keep that feeling, hey, you know what? If it doesn't work out, I'm okay being single. Then you are so much more likely to be honest and authentic that you bring a new, confident, dare I say, respectable, more lovable. I mean, I don't want to use those words because you're not you're not not lovable now, but you become more attractive when you're motivated by positive thoughts and feelings instead of the negative thoughts and feelings of I just don't want to be alone anymore. I know it's hard to get through, but once you have this change of perception and especially self-perception of I am worthy, I'm important, and I'm a great catch, damn it, your life does change and your relationships do change. You just have to embrace it. You just have to step into that. And I hope you do. Thanks so much for writing, Janet. And thanks for joining me today. We'll be right back. I'll say my final words and uh, close the show after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to remind you about the safe system for social anxiety over at quietbegins.com. Whether it's social anxiety, presentation anxiety, generalized anxiety, it's going to help. Go to quietbegins.com and see if the safe system is right for you. And I want to tell you about loveandabuse.com. If you haven't heard about the Love and Abuse podcast, it is a show about toxic behavior and poisonous communication. And um, it helps you understand the language and behavior of other people so that you stay educated and stay out of verbally and emotionally abusive relationships. And I don't mean just romantic relationships. This could be with family, coworkers. It could be with a number of people that have found a way to keep you feeling bad about yourself and just want you to be aware of that. And I don't want that to happen to you. So go over to loveandabuse.com and check out the podcast. And that's also where you can find a mean workbook which is a 200-point assessment on your relationship to figure out if you're in an emotionally abusive situation. Loveandabuse.com And I also want to thank uh, iTunes reviewer Uball2015. Let me say this. um, She was really verbose in her review, and I'm not going to read it here because there's a lot of personal stuff in there. And uh, at the end, she says, you know, I know this is supposed to be a review. (laughs) And, uh, And I want to tell you, thank you so much for sharing everything you did in that review. You certainly didn't have to say that whole story, but I'm glad you got it out. Maybe it helped you express it. Maybe it helped you vent it. And uh, thank you for your positive comments about the show. And I hope things improve in your life and continue to improve in your life. And at the end of the review, you said you look forward to listening to new episodes. And I look forward to sending you new episodes. So thank you, you ball 2015 
I appreciate you. And thanks for anyone who leaves reviews that I don't read on the air. I do eventually see them all. I mean, iTunes and other podcast players don't necessarily show you all the reviews from every country. Some of them do, some of them don't. So I try to get a hold of them as I can. And I am seeing them, so thank you again. I also want to thank patron members. If you want to support this show, that's the way to do it over at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. The patron site is where you can find all kinds of private episodes, private workbooks and worksheets, uh, stuff that you won't even find on my regular website at theoverwhelmedbrain.com. But um, it's a great way to show your support, and it's also how we continue going here. So when you are a patron member and you give what I believe to be a very, very small monthly donation, you not only get access to the, the, the membership site, but you also are supporting this show, which, like I said, keeps us going. So I appreciate you, everyone that is a patron member. We keep going because of your support. And uh, I am grateful for you. And also anyone that has donated or uses the Amazon link at theoverwhelmedbrain.com. And speaking of donations, Stacy, thank you for your generous donation. I appreciate you. I haven't sent you a personal reply yet, but know that I received it and it is at the top of my inbox. I'm going to reach out to you and thank you personally. It was an amazing gesture and I am truly moved by uh, your donation. So thank you so much, Stacy. And finally, as always, I'd like to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. You know, those Latin transitions. <laughs> and uh, just some final words on what I talked about today. I want you to be okay being single. I know I said that earlier, but even in when you're in a relationship, even if it's the best relationship in the world, I want you to have this thought, this feeling that, hey, if something happens, I'm going to be okay. Now, that's hard. It's hard to accept. If my girlfriend left me, I wouldn't be okay. <laughs> that's probably what you're saying. If my partner left me, I wouldn't be okay. Or I am alone and I'm not okay. A lot of you might feel this way. Some of you may not. Some of you may be in that space of, okay, I, you know, if something happens, I'm okay being single. I've done it before and I can do it again. The idea is what I was talking about earlier of being okay with you. That's really what you're saying. I'm okay with me. I'm okay with me the way I am. And there's nothing wrong with saying, and I'd like to share who I am with someone else. If that's your path, if that's what you want to do. I would like to be with someone else. I would like to have a romantic relationship with someone else. Again, if that's your path. If it's not, then you know, skip the rest of what I'm about to say. <laughs> because some people are perfectly happy really being single. And they want to stay single. And that's fine. And some people want a relationship. I'm the kind of guy who likes being in a relationship. I would rather be in one than not in one. And I think a lot of people can agree. But if something happened, if my girlfriend left me, if she died, you know, I hope not, or anything else, then I know that I am now in a space that I will be okay. I will mourn, I will grieve, and then I will be okay. I might be sad, I might be lonely, but I still will be okay. I want you to say that even if you're in a relationship, I will be okay if I'm single. Or if not those words, I will be okay if I'm alone. I will be okay. You can say, it's all right. You know how that loving person that you trust comes up to you, and if you don't know anyone like this, make it up in your head right now, <laughs> that comes up to you and says, Hey, everything's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Everything's going to be okay. You may not believe it. <laughs> you may think that's BS. I don't believe that because I am in terrible pain. And I've been this way for a long time. And I know it's not going to be okay. But that's what we got to work on. That's what we have to work on in ourselves. I'm okay because I'm enough. I'm okay because I'm worthy. I'm okay because I am important. I am significant. I am great. I am a great catch. And if you don't believe you're a great catch, that's why it's important to work on yourself. That's why it's important to improve yourself. And I don't mean just go to the gym and look better. It's not really that. That can have something to do with it. But I tell you what, if you're worried about physical appearance only, I've seen all kinds of body sizes together. And it doesn't seem to phase them. All kinds of body shapes and styles get into these relationships and it's because the relationship isn't about just the body. And maybe it is. I mean, maybe they're attracted to each other and that's great. I'm not saying it's either or. It could be either or. 
I'm saying that it's more than skin deep. We've heard this. And it's not just beauty. It's personality. It's that self-perception I was talking about. Sometimes when you see someone that has self-confidence, you're gravitated toward them. Like, wow, they have so much confidence. I want to follow that person. I want to be with that person. I want that confidence to rub off on me. When you start showing up like that, that's what happens. People gravitate towards you. They like being around you. You, They feel confident. They feel secure being around you. That's why it's important to, you know, I'm going to say it, use affirmations. (laughs) Like, I am great. I am a superstar. The people that don't want to be with me are missing out. (laughs) They are. They're missing out. But it has to start in you. It has to start with some positive self-talk. Yes, I'm sure there's negative self-talk, and I've talked about that in other episodes. Uh, One of the techniques I use is when I say something like, Oh, God, I'm so stupid. Why do they do that? I'm so stupid. Then I like to follow it up with, And I'm getting smarter every day. I like to follow it up with something positive. Or, I'm so stupid. Well, it's a lesson. I'm going to learn it and take it with me. Hey, there's something I can stick in my cap. Or how about, I'm so stupid and I'm a great catch. (laughs) Counter it in an indirect way. I'm so ugly and I'm brilliant. (laughs) You can have fun with it. That's what I like to do with negative self-talk. And sometimes I just own it. Ah, I'm so stupid and yeah, it's true. I'm stupid. Hey, Joe, I'm stupid. (laughs) Hey, honey, I'm stupid. I just want to let you know I'm admitting it now. I am stupid. Because we go through life trying to avoid and resist these things that we think about ourselves. But let's take out the resistance and see what happens. It makes me laugh. Hopefully it can make you laugh. I mean, this is where you're trying to get to. Because I I know you're not stupid. I know you're not ugly. I know you're not a bunch of things. Well, how do you know that, Paul? Because I believe that stuff is all self-perception. I believe that stuff isn't for anyone else to judge about you. Only about yourself. So let's just say when I see someone that I might not find attractive, if they found themselves attractive, they would become more attractive to me. It doesn't mean I would have them as a romantic partner or maybe not. I don't know. But it sure feels different being around someone who's confident in themselves, even when others can't see what they see. Because all perception is self-perception. All judgment is self-judgment. We think it comes from others, but it really comes from ourselves. Even when someone says, you're an idiot, You have to have some level of belief in yourself that you're an idiot in order for that to have an effect on you. And if that has an effect on you and you feel bad about it, then there's a part of you that already believes it. So it's time to work on yourself. That's how I look at things. I mean, that's what my girlfriend said to me once. She said, you're just being an idiot. And I laughed and she was serious. I think we were in the middle of an argument or something. And I just laughed and she goes, why are you laughing? You should be offended that I called you an idiot. And I said, I would be offended if I believed it. And then she stopped, (laughs) looked at me, and then laughed herself. (laughs) Because I didn't let her get to me. I didn't let her push my buttons like that because I didn't need to. Because I know I'm not an idiot. Not because I have a big ego or some narcissistic perception of myself. Not at all. It's because I've learned to have a healthier self-perception. I've learned that in order to be a great person to others, I have to feel great. I have to be great. I have to accept that I am smart, attractive, confident, all the things I may not have ever believed at one point because making that my reality makes it an external reality to others. And then when you start showing up in the world like that, people just treat you differently. You got to try it. I can't just tell you this. You got to try it. And yes, there may be a fake it till you make it part of this. Like, I have no confidence. Well, what if you did? What would a person with confidence act like? You know, you start role modeling, you start acting. What would a person who's a supermodel act like when they're walking through this room? What would a person who believed they could never fail do in this case? And if you're still having trouble trying that on and taking those steps, just keep an open mind so that you can step into your power. This will help you be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure and above all and this is something I absolutely know to be true and you must absorb this in your very being and integrate it at the deepest subconscious level you are amazing amazing